good in the presentation mode? All right. Hello. So do I just sit down with you? No, no, just run. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next talk in our series of talks today in track three. A couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, again, I'm sure some of you heard this many times before. Uh, thank you for conforming the mask policy. We really appreciate it. It helps keep, you know, it helps keep us all feel comfortable being here in this space. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable, remember you can always go outside and take them off. Masks are not required outside the building. Stay hydrated. I know we're getting later in the day, so it's not quite so important now, but it's always important so that you can be healthy and enjoy the rest of the talks in the conference. Please mute your phone for these sessions. The audio is super sensitive, so it picks up almost any sound other than, and we'd like to keep the focus on the talks. Uh, there is an unscheduled fourth talk track for anyone who wasn't able to get into any of the three principal tracks. You can go to the information desk. If you have an idea for a talk you want to give, you can go there and you can request and they'll find a time for you to be able to participate in the unscheduled track, which is in the, the coffee house. Uh, Hacker karaoke tonight at 10. Hopefully some of you will participate. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun. More volunteers are welcome. We can always use volunteers. There's all kinds of activities that we need help with, especially in terms of security. So if you're interested, stop by room 301 or go to volunteer.hope.net and sign up. And lastly, the first late night block of mature content programming starts at 9.30 in the video room, which is 406, fourth floor, all the way over. Uh, tonight's video room late night theme is humor and horror. So expect the unexpected is what they tell me. Uh, for the talk, Novel Exploitation Tactics in Linux User Space, One Byte OOB Write to ROP Chain by Sammy Hallman. Is everything showing stuff? No. Oh. <laughs> All right, hi. Uh, welcome to Novel Exploitation Tactics in Linux User Space with the Runtime Loader. Uh, we're going to be utilizing the runtime loader to exploit some vulnerabilities when these vulnerabilities are considered weak and the security checks are considered high. So let's get right in. First off, who am I? Uh, I'm Sammy Hachamid. Uh, I go by Pepsipu on Twitter, my handle, stuff like that. Uh, I'm a student at Troy High School. Uh, I'm also uh, the founder and reverse engineer at BSwap Labs, but I also do blockchain security auditing and vulnerability research at OtterSec. Um, I also uh, play CTFs for fun, uh, Dice Gang CTF and Red Phone CTF for my team. Hi, Dice Gang, see you in the free part room. All right, so let's get right into the talk. First off, what's this presentation about? Well, the process of turning vulnerabilities into exploits is hard. There's a lot of protections which exist to make this even harder. And it's complicated, but the runtime loader can make it a lot easier. First, to show this, we're going to start with a weak vulnerability. And this vulnerability is going to be under extremely powerful protections. So we'll talk about those protections later. And through that, we're still going to get arbitrary code execution. So let's get right in. All right, vulnerability exploitation made easy. Houses. Houses are a sort of pre-baked series of steps to turn a vulnerability into a full-fledged exploit. Generally, this is kind of just sort of a helping process. You know, turning vulnerabilities into exploits is hard, and houses kind of give you a roadmap to do that process. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, popular houses. Like to your right, you can see uh, a list of the how to heap houses. And there's also some unlisted, like House of Red, House of Husk, House of Corrosion, all very popular and well-respected houses in CTF and exploitation. But the one aspect that all these houses share is that they're portable. See, the series of steps to turn the vulner vulnerability into the exploit should be roughly the same as long as the vulnerabilities are roughly the same. For example, Two programs with the same vulnerability, let's say top chunk header overwrite, should both be exploitable by using House of, uh, House of Force. And even if those two programs are Minecraft and Chrome, as long as they share that core vulnerability, they can kind of share that core process of turning the vulnerability into an exploit. So how do programs do this? Well, the answer is libraries. Instead of leveraging the vulnerability against the program, Houses use the vulnerability against a shared library. The overwhelming majority of, of houses that the vulnerability is leveraged against is libc, or the GNU C library. It's over, the most overwhelmingly popular C library. It's really the de facto standard, and it's used in almost 100% of Linux programs. It provides everything from printing to memory management, file operations, you name it. 
And so if you can find a way to use your vulnerability against libc, you'll be able to have a portable house. So <clears throat> let's take an example. Uh, let's say we have a buffer overflow on the heap. Let's say we allocate two chunks, chunk one and chunk two. For those who don't know, these chunks end up on the heap. It's sort of a free use location of memory where programs can put their data. Now let's say we have a buffer overflow in chunk one. This means that we're writing data outside the bounds of chunk one. Is it a better idea to A, overwrite the chunk two header, or B, overwrite the chunk two program data? As you see in this little diagram right here. Well, you can make a case for both, but in the case for houses, it's a lot easier to say, let's overwrite the chunk two header. This is because the allocator's behavior, in libc anyways, his behavior is very well studied and well documented. And there exist multiple pre-baked steps, houses, to turn this chunk two header overwrite into remote co-execution. So you can kind of use somebody else's work by overwriting the header. The program data, on the other hand, is different from each program to program, so you'd have to roll your own solution. Just like that, you could kind of see the power of houses, that they're portable. All right, how do I find a house? Well, finding houses is hard, mostly because there's a lot of eyes, not only from hackers looking for new houses, but libc maintainers patching all those houses that are getting generated. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. If you can look at an attack surface in a new way, or perhaps find a new one entirely, you can still get a really cool house out of it. So let's talk about the surface I decided to look at. Exit. Programs tend to exit pretty frequently. I mean, not only calling the exit function, but returning from main or tossing errors tends to call exit under the hood. And I don't mean errors just in your program, but libc errors as well may cause an exit. Now, forcing exits with vulnerabilities is pretty simple. I mean, uh, it's very easy to co corrupt some sort of libc state and cause an exit by throwing an error. So if you can find some sort of process or inject your own code into that exit process, you could potentially get a house out of it. So <clears throat> we've seen this kind of uh, done before. I mean, it has a pretty good track record. Uh, if you take a look at, for example, the libc exit hook overwrite, it was a kind of a cool tactic where you could just kind of write a function pointer to a location memory called libc at, at exit hook, and that would be called when the program decided to exit. There's another one called House, House of Orange, which would uh, exploit the IO cleanup process and would look up a piece of memory, and it would call the function pointer at that, at that piece of memory. Of course, both of these both have mitigations, and the libc at exit hook has very strong mitigation, pointer encryption. So uh, it's kind of not super viable anymore, but you can kind of see that it still is a cool attack surface to look at. All right, let's take a deeper deeper look. Okay, so right off the bat, you can see at the top, you have the code for exit. Um, it calls one function, run exit handler, with a, a list of exit functions. It's, it's a little complicated, but when you break it down, it comes down to, I guess, four separate steps. The first three looking potentially exploitable. The first step is to run TLS detours. We don't know what that is for now, but let's just keep that in the back of our head. Then we call the exit handlers, sort of cleanup processes that are registered by the program or libc or something, and those are run. And finally, we call libc at exit. Then we call the actual exit syscall, which terminates the program. That's the underscore exit at the bottom. Now, it seems like a complicated process, but we can break it down step by step. First off, let's take a look at the TLS detours call. These are also known as thread destructors. Basically, they kind of are a list of functions to call to clean up when a thread terminates. Now, if we could somehow inject our own thread destructor, we might be able to get remote code execution. Unfortunately, it turns out we can't do this. If you take a look at the commits, uh, Florian Weimer introduced a uh, hardening of the TLS detour calling seven years ago. And no longer can you write an arbitrary function pointer and get it called. Now it's pointer mangled, meaning you need to know lots of secrets about the program and other things that makes writing uh, just a function pointer completely inviolable. So you need a very, very strong vulnerability. And it's the same difficulty as just overwriting libc at exit. So no dice with a weak vulnerability. All right, what about the exit function handlers? Well, it's sort of just a linked list of exit functions and they all have their own uh, flavor. For example, you can see this big switch statement in the code, which kind of tells you uh, what types of exits you can have. Although they do vary from, from uh, flavor to flavor, 
all of them implement pointer mangling or pointer encryption, whatever you want to call it. And so unfortunately, you cannot inject your own function, uh, exit function handler without knowing uh, memory leaks or knowing a little bit more information about the program. You can't use a weak vulnerability. So that's really unfortunate. At this point, you might be stumped, truly lost even. Unfortunately, uh, that's just how it is sometimes. And I had given up and I said, hey, maybe the atta exit attack surface was dry. And so I took a break. However, I was playing a CTF not too long, and then I remembered a trick in CTF. It's called the Feeny Array Overwrite. And then I was like, wait, how does this trick work? Let me give you a crash course, the Feeny Array trick. Basically, a common tactic in CTF is called a GOT overwrite. Basically, the table, uh, the table, the global offset table, contains a list of function pointers. Overwriting one of these function pointers with your own function or own function pointer would cause that function to get called instead of the function it's supposed to get called. For example, you could see in the image if we have GOT, the, the first entry, zero entry, is string copy. If we overwrite that with something else, like for example, uh, dead beef, then you'd end up calling dead beef when string copy is supposed to be called. Now, sometimes overwriting the GOT isn't always available. So there's sort of an extension of the GOT tech. Very close to the GOT exists this variable called Feeny Array. Now, if you overwrite Feeny Array and write your own function pointer to Feeny Array, then you can call whatever's there. It'll get called when you exit. But hold on for a second, isn't that a little weird? Didn't we take a look at the exit code and we saw nothing calling Feeny Array? So how does Feeny Array work? Well, it's a good question. And the answer is DL Feeny. It's an extremely complicated function, but it is super cool because there's a lot of complexity inside of it. Maybe complexity we could exploit. Now, this is the uh, shared library unloader function. Uh, it, it's the one that cleans up all the shared library, unloads everything, calls all the destructors, stuff like that. So it's kind of just like the, the memory cleaner upper for all the shared libraries you have. Now, it's really interesting, right? Because this is a complicated function that not only has complexity, but 18-year-old code. So it could be some, some attack vector we could take advantage of here to get uh, potentially like remote co-execution or something like that. And so that's exactly what I did in a house called House of Blindness. Basically, it's kind of taking advantage of this DL Feeny uh, function to call arbitrary functions without ever needing memory leaks. Now, the way it works is you take a standard vulnerability, remember houses turn vulnerabilities into exploits, and the vulnerability that House of Blindness takes is out of bounds heap write. What it does is it takes the out of bound heap write and turns that into leakless function arbitrary co-execution, which means you can call whatever function you want without needing to know ASLR base or any of those things. And so it's kind of like a new leakless take uh, on the classic Feeny Array exploit, which is since kind of a little deprecated. It's not, not very useful anymore. Anyways, uh, it's all written in this little document right here. Uh, it's linked. I'll post the slides at the end if you want to check it out. But uh, I'd like to read you guys a little synopsis of what House of Blindness is about. House of Blindness isn't a conventional overwrite Feeny and Array style exploit. Rather, by a few clever partial overrides and interesting runtime dynamic loader properties, you can trick the runtime loader into miscalculating where Feeny is in memory. The only primitive we need is relative write. Did I mention we can do this completely leaklessly? So basically, we can call arbitrary functions without memory leaks. And how exactly <laughs> does this work? Well, I'll first have to tell you something about link maps. Link maps are basically information about a shared object. Uh, those shared objects could include libc, the runtime loader, the program, stuff like that. It has some important fields. For example, ladder is where that shared library is loaded into memory but also has linfo, which is uh, where all the data structures about that link map is. For example, the location of the global offset table, location of the destructor functions, DT Feeny, is there. And there's also things like the, the constructor functions and all that stuff. It's all where all the information about the shared object is. And so you might think, hey, if we can somehow corrupt this link map with a something like an out-of-bounds write vulnerability, maybe we can get some interesting behavior out of it. And that's exactly what House of Blindness did. Basically, we caused the Feeny function to be miscalculated. And this is done through something called an LSB overwrite. In a normal link map, as you can see in this diagram, generally a ladder points at where the shared object is in memory. And then it uses the DT Feeny array points to some offset from that uh, start address, this ladder. And so, for example, in this program, the uh, DT Feeny function would be located at uh, the start of the program plus 0x451 bytes. Now, by using our out of bounds write, we may be able to corrupt this link map and cause the DT Feeny function to be miscalculated. 
in this specific case, instead of using an LSB overwrite, we can cause DT Fini to point at an entirely different dynamic entry. In this case, DT debug. Now DT debug is useful because instead of having an offset, our debug is an actual pointer. And so what you end up doing is you end up adding this pointer to the start of the program base, which as you know is not a valid pointer. However, we can fix this. By overriding the L adder with some arbitrary offset, we can basically call any function from an offset from our debug. Now our debug is located in the same, roughly the same memory region as libc, it's adjacent in memory, which means that we could call any libc function by specifying our offset in L adder and then calling that uh, using house of blindness. So we can arbitrarily call any libc function, which is very useful. And I thought this was pretty cool, a little, a little curious, um, but that was just the tip of the iceberg and I didn't know it at the time. Uh, I had compiled all this research into this uh, about DL Feeney and House of Blindness and all that into this document called Issues in Exit Town. I didn't really like, publish it or anything. I just kind of shared it around with my CTF friends and got some feedback on it. But it really was the tip of the iceberg of what you can do with the runtime loader. So let's keep going. So even now I had thought that, you know, ah, I was done. I had finally got my house mission complete, right? But Dice CTF 2022 was ro rolling around. I decided there probably was more to be found. And so that's exactly what I did. I decided to go back in and do some more. In this case, I created the Nightmare CTF challenge, which basically, instead of giving you the out of bounds on the heap required for House of Blindness, instead, you got one byte out of bound right and a ton of security protections. The most important security protection here is no leak. This means that you have absolutely no memory leak and you don't know where uh, any addresses are in memory. And so it can be a lot more complicated to exploit like this. But the program itself, we'll talk about that more later. But the program itself is pretty simple. If you look at the code, it reads an offset and a byte from the user and then it does the write. <laughs> it writes that byte to that offset for some ch allocated chunk. After that, it exits. And so it's, that seems like a very simple program but it actually can get pretty complicated. And um, we can learn a lot about, about the runtime loader by going through this program. But first, uh, let's talk about the um, security protections. The first security restriction, and by far the most severe and restrictive, um, is there is no two-way communication. Although you can communicate with the program, the program cannot communicate with you. This means that there's absolutely no way to leak ASLR base or somehow uh, figure out a memory leak or something. It's just not possible because the program cannot communicate that information to you. This means the entire time you are working blind. You don't know where any pointers are in memory, but you still have to somehow build a ROP chain. And we'll talk about this more later, but the issue is that there really isn't a current known way to build a ROP chain without memory leak. By definition, you need to be able to write arbitrary pointers in a sort of a list right, to create a ROP chain, but that requires knowing memory leaks. And since we don't know any memory leaks here because there's no two-way communication, it's kind of a bust. However, we will be able to beat this, but we'll talk about that later. The second restriction, built on the first, uh, it's preventing brute force. In a lot of blind challenges where the users don't know memory leaks and can't defeat ASLR, often you have to use some brute force. Generally, this brute force is either 4 to 12 bits. For example, the unsorted bin attack and House of Corrosion both require, at minimum, guessing 4 bits of entropy. And so this is a brute force that could potentially cause your program to fail. And if it's like 4 bits, you know, 1 16 chance, so it can get messy, right? So uh, no brute force, which makes this program or uh, exploiting it a lot harder. Finally, there's a sandbox using seccomp. It prevents you... It, really disallows everything except the bare minimum to read the flag and get the program running. And so uh, it, you can't really just, you know, just call system and get a shell or something. And this is supposed to be kind of like emulate a sandbox process, which is like, you know, it's suppo supposed to just do computation, right? And so uh, it's, it sounds like a little difficult, right? Because um, how are you supposed to get a ROP chain with, with all these protections? But it's possible. And to do it, we're going to be using three new houses, all leveraging the runtime loader and get these primitives. Uh, and the last primitive will achieve something that has never been gone, gotten before with the house, which will allow us to finally get ROP. So let's get right into it with our pre preliminary analysis. How do we get more bytes? Well, going from one byte write to infinite byte writes is probably the move here. As you could imagine, encoding an entire ROP chain and remote code execution cycle with um, just one byte isn't really possible. It's only eight bits of entropy. You can't encode an entire ROP chain with that. 
So our first uh, you know, course of action should probably be to get more byte writes. And this was sort of a warm up for the users. It's supposed to show them a little bit about the runtime loader and kind of get them warmed up with it. But it's worth noting, it's very contrived. It's, it's an interesting puzzle, but it doesn't have any real world bearing. There's not really a time where you're supposed to you know, go from one byte write to infinite byte writes in the real world. It's, it's not really make sense. But I think it was a good, it's a good puzzle for competitors to get used to the runtime loader. And so it kind, you can kind of ask, okay, so how do we get infinite byte writes? And the first course of action is to choose a surface to attack. But as you look at the program, you might notice there's not really any attack surfaces here. Every function in the code is um, all just syscalls. The read is a syscall, write is a syscall. Malloc happens before, so that's not really relevant. But the read, write, and exit are all syscalls. Be warned, the exit here is not the exit we've been talking about with the you know, calling exit handlers, but rather is just a thin wrapper over the exit syscall. So there's not really anywhere where a one byte write could be useful, but there actually is, and it's in between the lines. It's complexity that's out of sight. And that's the runtime loader once again. Basically, symbols such as you know, write, exit, read, malloc are all being looked up at runtime. The program needs to know where these are located in memory so they can call these functions like write, like read, like write, like exit. And so you have to call the runtime loader to look up these look up these symbols for you. The function that does this is called DL fixup. And it's quite a complicated process actually. And it could be a very useful target for a one byte write. We can potentially use the one byte write on the state of DL fix up to get infinite byte writes. And so let's try that. But first, we have to establish that if exit doesn't get called, you get infinite byte writes. This is actually due to technicality. It's, a, it's a, because of GCC optimizations and function orders. As again, this is a little contrived. It's not actually useful in the real world. But if exit doesn't get called, you'll get infinite byte writes. And so the question is, how do we prevent exit from getting called by modifying the state of DL fixup. Well, uh, the, the way I did it anyways, was by doing an LSB overwrite on the L adder of the link map. Now, it sounds a little weird, and it, I guess it kind of is, right? But um, you, you can kind of learn on why uh, exit doesn't, if exit doesn't get called, that causes infinite byte writes on, on the blog I linked earlier. Uh, it goes into detail, line by line breakdown, all that. But for now, let's just take it as a given. So to do this LSB overwrite on L adder, what we'll do is we'll modify the least significant byte, which basically is like the same as adding a small constant to L adder. This causes the GOT location of write to be miscalculated. This, this instead of writing the write function to the write location in the global offset table, we'll instead write the write function, and that's a little confusing because, you know, same name, but we'll write the write function to exit in the global offset table. This means that exit will not get called and we'll call write instead of exit. That way we'll end up looping the program. All right, that's super cool, but what do we do once we have infinite byte writes? Well, we get leakless address call, of course. We're gonna be calling arbitrary functions using DL fixup a second time. This is actually a new house. It's called house of fixup. Uh, I don't know, that's the side name I chose. But um, it's a little more complicated than House of Blindness, but it uses that core structure of using R debug to forge fake entries of di the dot dynamic section. For example, the two entries in the dot dynamic section that we're forging here is DT sim tab and DT string tab. These two entries specify information about how symbols should be looked up. For example, it'll tell you uh, the name of the, of the right function is W-R-I-T-E. And it'll also tell you like uh, other information for DL fixup to figure out where write is located in memory. By forging this, we can cause DL fixup to miscalculate where functions like write, like read, like exit are located in memory. And in doing that, we can use our debug to kind of make those fake sim uh, symbols tables or string tables. And so it could be pretty useful. As you can see a diagram of how this is mod modified, uh, it's not super important to the talk, but um, basically we can call arbitrary functions using fixup. That's our second usage of, fix, of DL fixup. As you can see, it's a pretty cool function. All right, but from here, you may, uh, or the, what we also do is we, we uh, used house of fixup to get house of blindness. It's worth noting that house of blindness is significantly more useful than house of fixup. This is because house of blindness allows you to still call any arbitrary function, but it also lets you specify a parameter for that arbitrary function. Well, house of fixup is just a blank call. It doesn't let you specify any arguments for that function. So as you can imagine, it's more useful to specify an argument for any arbitrary function you're calling. 
And so we do this, but we, we migrate from House of Fixup to House of Blindness by calling DL Feeny using House of Fixup. Remember, uh, House of Blindness is only called with DL Feeny. So if we call DL Feeny, we can start using House of Blindness. And we do that with a relatively simple process, you know, using House of Fixup. All right, now that we have arbitrary calling leaklessly, what do we do from here? Because yeah, we can call functions, that's cool and all, and we've escalated our vulnerability from just an out of bounds write to uh, calling functions, but we need ROP from here if we wanna do anything like reading a flag from memory. And the issue is, is that ROP needs leaks. It's in order to make a ROP chain, you need to specify the functions you're going to call or return to in the ROP chain, right? However, writing these functions out in memory is impossible unless you have memory leak. So what do we do? Well, we'll need a man on the inside. We'll need someone inside the program or a piece of code in the program which can write these addresses for us. So we kind of need this ROP writer, right? We need, we need someone who can write arbitrary po uh, pointers to arbitrary locations in memory. So what is it going to be? How are we going to get a ROP writer? How are we gonna write arbitrary pointers to arbitrary locations? The answer is, of course, DL fixup. For the third time, we're using DL fixup again. It's a great attack surface. And what we're gonna do is, it's actually super cool how this is done. Basically, we're gonna say, it's because basically a D DL fixup is a three-step process, right? What it does is it looks up a symbol in libc, and then it looks up where that symbol should be written in the GOT, and then it writes the symbol to the GOT. So it's a three-step process. It does the lookup, and then it does the where it should be written, and then it actually writes it, right? So three steps. Um, and then you can kind of say, okay, well, how does DL fixup know where, for example, exit is in libc? And how does, it, how does DL fixup know where, exi uh, where exit should be written in the GOT? And these are two very good questions, right? How does DL fixup know that? And by asking that question, you can end up getting arbitrary symbols to arbitrary locations. Because what you can do is you can trick DL fixup into writing the wrong symbol to the wrong location. And just like that, you can write arbitrary pointers. And so it's super cool because you can kind of, you know, use that to build a ROP chain. However, this is a lot easier said than done. It required an absolutely hellish amount of legwork. It required not only several supplementary houses and exploits that are including, but not limited to, global max fast uh, for uncontrolled pointer, right? IO string overflow and IO string finish for malloc free primitives, uh, credits to not the ghost slash Robert Chen for that. Uh, double freeze using the IO save base and its associated functions. Open mem stream to spray pointers into a chunk, among other le lesser primitives and houses. It's a complicated process. In fact, it could probably be an entire presentation by itself. And so uh, the entire process is, of course, documented on the blog post I mentioned earlier. Um, but it could definitely be an entire uh, presentation on itself. Anyways, this construction of uh, you know tricking DL fix up with this uh, fake link map we're crafting, uh, using all these different uh, supplementary houses and stuff, actually ends up in a very beautiful construction, and that construction is house of sight. I see a diagram of what that construction looks like. Basically, we build a fake link map using all those different um, you know supplementary houses and exploits I mentioned, and what we end up with is this, this construction, which when DL fix up is called on, ends up writing arbitrary pointers to arbitrary locations. It's a two-parameter system, so we specify where we want to write the pointer and then what we want to write by shifting around two values. We shift around the where parameter to, to ad ad uh, adjust where exactly that, that pointer gets written, and then we can adjust the what parameter to, uh, to, to adjust what pointer gets written. But like that, we can build a ROP chain. The process of actually calling this ROP chain is hell on its own, but... Um, it's documented in the blog post if that's a technical detail you're interested in. But the point is, is that house, uh, or, um, all these houses using the runtime loader are very cool. And I talk about this in the presentation more, or the, the blog post more, but the power of offsets is really shown here. Because, uh, because the, the DL fix up and all the runtime loaders operate on sort of offsets, you don't really need to specify pointers. You can just specify offsets. And that has very good implica implications for leakless exploits, such as House of Sight, House of, house of uh, Blindness, and House of Fixup, because all these houses don't require memory leaks. Offsets are more powerful than pointers. And that's it. That's uh, the Nightmare Challenge. It had all these three houses and allowed us to never before write pointers to arbitrary locations without needing memory leak. 
Uh, it was a lot of fun because you can learn a lot, a lot about the runtime loader. Uh, you can learn a lot about houses, and it was honestly so much fun to make, and it was really fun to talk with competitors about uh, their attempted solutions. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't have any uh, solutions by the end of the CTF, but uh, later I talked with a lot of competitors about it and, you know, gave them the right hints, and someone actually solved it in the end, so that was super cool. Uh, but yeah, it was a lot of fun, and it was really cool to learn about. Uh, if you want, the link is up there, a tiny URL of uh, the slides, if you want all the links in this presentation. So you might want to take a screenshot, that's something you're into. But yeah, that's it. That's, uh, that's the runtime loader and how it can be used. So, yep. Excellent, Daniel. So now if anyone has any questions, it's time for Q&A. Feel free to ask Daniel any question. No, looks like there aren't any questions. Thank you so much. Oh, there's part. a question back there. I'm guessing oh. a lot of, this code is a lot of indexes. A lot of this went a little over my head. But <laughs> no when problem. you're doing those drop channels, I, maybe there's a point that I missed. Because I thought you usually, right, you know the runtime loader and you know the relative offset of the functions in the standard library, but you don't know where it's loading. And I thought that's where you needed a, a leak. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the entire point here is that we don't know base, right? And that could cause a lot of problems. So uh, he, he said, uh, wait, hold on a second. Uh, ROP chains require you to know base, right? You need to know the base of the where the shared library or libc is loaded, so that way you can write those addresses. And that's that's very true. In a normal circumstance, you need to know the base of the, the uh, shared library or libc or whatever. But in this specific case, what we're using is we can only specify the offset and then what we have is, remember that, that man on the inside, that ROP chain writer, which in this case is house, house of site, which allows us to write um, those addresses in the ROP chain with, by only specifying the offset without specifying the base. And the reason why, we, why not specifying the base is such a powerful tool is because getting base requires a vulnerability on its own. Remember, you need a memory leak or something like that which can tell you what exactly the libc base is. But the runtime loader allows us to not have to know that. We don't need that separate information or that separate vulnerability. We can do it without it by using DL fixup and its associated functions. So yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, what's up? Oh yeah, so um, actually a lot of CTF wikis will list a lot of the different houses for specific attack surfaces. For example, I know uh, the How to Heap repository, which is by the Shellfish CTF team, maintains an active list of all the, the current and patched houses for a specific uh, type of attack surface called the Heap. Um, but um, yeah, basically there's an entire list of those houses. It's big, I think it's like 28, 29 or something like that, but it's, it's a big list of houses. So yeah, if that's something you wanna learn, I'd recommend checking it out. Uh, yeah, what's up? The structures you're overriding, they're part of the dynamic loader. If you have a standard library, is that still available? Is that still loading in your process? So he mentions that uh, this, this process might only, only work for shared libraries, right? Because if it's statically loaded, then you don't end up doing uh, this sort of uh, this uh, relocation process because you already know all the addresses in memory. This is true. In fact, um, if the binary is statically loaded, you don't end up using functions like DL fixup because you already know the location of every address in memory. This means DL fixup is never called, so you can never really use this exploit. However, that's okay. Most times, uh, all, all binaries, in, um, or majority speaking, are all dynamically loaded. So usually, that's not much of an issue. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, so this is true. Um, this is called rel row. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, uh, he, he mentions that um, very often that the, the, the functions in the GOT are calculated before runtime, which is true. Yeah, it happens sometimes. Um, it's not all the time, but it 
does happen quite frequently where people will enable rel rel in their programs. And this means that you all of them were calculated beforehand, so DL fixup never gets called. In this specific case, um, House of Blindness still applies because it's at exit time, but for the House of Sight and House of Fixup, both of those require DL fixup, and that is only called uh, when you're when you when you have partial rel row because partial rel row is that when it does it, it's called lazy loading. It does it at um, at a uh, runtime, but as you mentioned, yeah, there's also full rel row which does it before. Yeah, yeah, good, great, great question. All right, no more questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Sammy. It was an excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, stick around at 9 o'clock. The next talk will be not enough, just enough RID cloning to be dangerous. So stick around for the talk. Thank you. <laughs>